Um, so this is the last class and I'll be covering uh, several topics. Uh, I mean, there was not much time, so I'll not be going into details, but I'll just be presenting the ideas. Um, OK, so. So last time we covered dust in the interstellar medium. Uh, we had actually at some point talked about. Talked about this. Uh, uh, ionization uh, equilibrium in H2 regions, heating in H2 regions, uh, photoelectric heating, cooling due to recombination, uh, cooling due to uh, excitation of metal lines and all that. So, so that was H2 region. The H2 regions are around 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin. That sort of comes from thermal equilibrium consideration. So today we'll start with. Uh, uh, <clears throat> H1 gas, neutral hydrogen gas. So uh, cooling and heating of H1 gas or H1 regions. So H1 is neutral hydrogen. Most of the ISM mass is actually in the uh, neutral hydrogen uh, phase or sort of almost about equal in molecular and neutral phase. Uh, but a lot of it is in uh, H1, neutral hydrogen phase. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, just let me uh, tell you the sort of first thing, which is that uh, neutral phases, it should not, you know, the distribution of temperature of neutral hydrogen is not expected to be uniform. You expect it to be uh, near sort of 5000 Kelvin few thousand Kelvin and close to 100 Kelvin, and we'll come to the reason for that. So, uh, so keep an eye out for two phases uh, of H1. This is the theoretical expectation, but some of the observations are not quite consistent with the perfect two phase. OK. Uh, so how do we get the thermal structure of neutral H1? Again, we have to do the thermodynamics, cooling and heating processes of neutral H1. So, uh, what are what are the heating uh, heating processes uh, of H1 neutral hydrogen gas? Uh, um, you have ionization by cosmic rays. Uh, so, cosmic ray ionization. Uh, so, basically, cosmic rays are these very energetic, relativistic. Uh, particles, mostly protons, and they have a small cross sectional interaction, but they have a lot of energy. So they can sometimes uh, ionize a neutral hydrogen. And since they have so much energy, the electron that's produced by ionization also is very high energy electron. So these are called secondary electrons, and those, you know, few tens of EV electrons can further ionize. Uh, neutral hydrogen. OK, so this is a cosmic ray ionization and heating. So whenever you have ionization, the electron will have the extra uh, thermal energy and that it can thermalize with uh, its neighbors. Um, so cosmic rays and then you have. Uh, <coughs> uh, photo ionization. Uh, by X-rays. See, Lyman continuum photons uh, are absorbed by neutral gas and just produce in H2 regions. But if you go to X-rays, the cross-section sigma for photoionization decreases, right? As if you go to very high energy, it can actually decrease so much that uh, you know the uh, X-rays can penetrate predominantly neutral regions of the ISM. Okay. OK, what else? Uh, so photo. Ionization. Uh, of dust grains. By UV, so we know that for uh, for photon energy get greater than 13.6 EV. Uh, it's neutral hydrogen that absorbs. Uh, the UV. 
Lyman continuum UV. But below 13.6 uh, EV, dust is, a, is an important absorber of those UV photons. And what happens is uh, you have a dust grain, you have, say, a 10 EV photon. 10 EV is greater than the work function for a lot of these materials out of which uh, uh, grains are formed, right? You know, uh, graphite, uh, silicates, and all those have work functions, right? Work function is this photoelectric effect concept that you need photon energy greater than that in order to ionize uh, this material. So, so the the physical process is similar to photoionization of neutral hydrogen by Lyman continuum photons, but here the lower uh, energy photons are uh, important because everything greater than 13.6 EV is absorbed by neutral hydrogen. So, you know, say less than 13.6 EV and, you know, <clears throat> and greater than, say, you know, 5 EV or something like the typical work function for, uh, for dust grains. <clears throat> and you can also have, so in the same way, Ions, some ions like carbon, magnesium have lower ionization potential. So they can be ionized by these photons which have lower uh, than 13.6 EV uh, ionization potential. So you can have those uh, metal uh, photo ionization. And then you can have, you know, uh, dissipation of MHD waves, uh, shocks and whatnot. So there are a lot of processes, but out of these, the most dominant is this one, uh, photoionization of dust grains by UV, uh, and followed by this cosmic ray ionization. Um, <clears throat> so, so let's talk about cosmic ray ionization, um, sort of heating. So it's sometimes characterized by this uh, zeta CR. <clears throat> and the zeta CR is a primary ionization uh, rate uh, due to cosmic rays. So what is meant by primary ionization? As I said, a, a cosmic ray proton or a cosmic ray ion hits a neutral hydrogen, it will ionize it. That's the, the electron produced because of that is called a primary electron. But the electron that is produced is very high energy because cosmic rays have like GeV, MeV energies. So that electron will further ionize uh, other neutral atoms. So those are called secondaries. So here, this zeta CR is only characterizing primary ionizations due to cosmic rays. Uh, and the typical value is about 7 times 10 to the minus 18. Uh, photo, primary photoionizations per second, right? So this is the value. Uh, so uh, let's see. So this value will depend on what the cosmic ray flux is, right? If you have a higher cosmic ray flux in the ambient ISM, this value will be higher. Right. If you don't have cosmic rays at all, this should be zero. It should not. Uh, so this is for a typical cosmic ray uh, abundance in the ISM. Okay, and it's dominated by uh, lowest energy cosmic rays because number-wise, the cosmic rays at the lowest energies are the maximum, and also the cross sections are higher at lower energies. So, you know, if you look at the cosmic ray spectrum in log log space, so this is log energy log of flux of cosmic rays. It peaks at around a GeV or, you know, a few hundred MeVs. These are the cosmic ray, uh, cosmic ray protons or ions which dominate uh, ionization, um, right, out of these all energy. And this, the slope of this is like minus two point. Uh, seven roughly okay um so this is fine so this is the ionization rate uh due to cosmic rays uh, 
<clears throat> and if Xe is high, Xe is the electron fraction. If if Xe is high, means that uh, ionization is high, so it's not predominantly neutral. In that case, uh, most of the energy of this primary electron that has been uh, released is uh, sort of, uh, it will sort of Coulomb interact with other electrons and it will share its energy with other electrons. So most of the energy, when, when the ionization fraction is high, most of the energy of this primary electron goes into the thermal energy of other electrons. Okay, if I, so, so most uh, energy goes into kinetic energy. If Xe is low, that is the medium is predominantly neutral. In that case, what you can have is that the secondary electron. So the secondary electron that is produced sort of has a spectrum which peaks at about 35 EV. Right, 35 EV is actually quite a lot. Right, it can ionize photons many times over. Uh, it can ionize hydrogen, many hydrogen atoms, right? So in, in case when Xe is low, what happens is this, this second, uh, this uh, primary electron can actually excite a lot of these neutrals. And these neutrals de-excite and lose photons. So in that way, not all the energy in the primary goes into the, phot the photoelectrons kinetic energy. So, you know, it has a, so basically, there will be a pre-factor in Xc is uh, in the case when Xc is small, when the medium is neutral, some of the energy is lost in radiative transitions. Okay. Uh, Xc is the ion, so Xc is equal to number of electrons divided by number of uh, hydrogen atoms plus ions. That's the definition. Of, so basically, electron fraction. If you have a, if you have a <clears throat> hydrogen plasma, which is fully ionized, Xc will be one. <clears throat> so, so this is sort of the microphysics of it. Uh, now I'll just sort of write the formula, okay, which is there in Brain's book. Uh, so you don't have to bother too much about uh, like copying it or something, but uh, yeah, so let me actually. Write. So this is just the primary ionization rate. So what you want are after is this, right? This is uh, <clears throat> this is basically heating a per unit time uh, per unit volume, right? So this is the heating rate uh, density caused due to cosmic ray collisions. So that's about. 10 to the minus 27 times NH. This is neutral hydrogen density uh, times zeta cosmic rays by 10 to the minus 16 uh, per second. So this zeta CR is the number of primary ionizations due to cosmic rays in the ambient conditions in the ISM. Uh, and then there is a dependence of so one plus four Xe by Xe plus 0.07. This I don't really, uh, yeah. So this actually motivates the fact that I was actually telling. When Xe is one, uh, this becomes five, rough, roughly five, right? So it's one by 1.07. So that, that's about four plus one, five. So where, when Xe is large, uh, when X is small, this factor can be small because a lot of energy can be lost due to radiative uh, transitions. Right? So this formula just expresses what I just said in the in words. Uh, now to derive all this, you know, you really have to look at the original papers. Uh, so the thing to notice is what does it depend on? The heating rate per unit uh, volume depends on the number density of hydrogen uh, atoms, neutral hydrogen atoms. Uh, it depends on the uh, this primary ionization rate, but the primary ionization rate will be proportional to the, how much is the cosmic ray flux. So this depends on the abundance of uh, cosmic rays. 
OK, so this is about cosmic rays. Um, <clears throat> so cosmic rays can also sort of collide or you know interact with electrons and can directly give give their energy to electrons. Uh, so that there is cosmic ray electron heating uh, and that is also proportional to zeta CR time and any. I mean, this is. With an electron and shares it's some of its kinetic energy with the electron and then that electron shares it with the other particles and raises the temperature of the neutral gas. Um, so if you have, so this is just cosmic rays. So this is the first heating process for neutral gas. Second is uh, X-ray uh, ionization and heating. So X-ray produces into ionizing that and the rest of the energy is available as the kinetic energy of the electrons, uh, photoelectrons. Uh, it also produces second, right? Because you know we are talking about a KeV, uh, KeV photon. So it will also produce a, a very high energy electron, photoelectron, uh, and it will produce secondary electrons for the same reason that uh, cosmic rays produce it. In fact, uh, um, you know, at at the ground level also. So if you if you have done this experiment of, you know, you take a, a tube uh, with low density and you have this anode and cathode, and if you raise the uh, voltage beyond say a you know close to a thousand volts the discharge becomes ionized right it becomes a plasma uh, a new predominantly neutral plasma but a plasma nonetheless that process is started due to cosmic rays you know the the little ionization that acts as a spark in this experiment is due to cosmic rays coming from uh, from up there so so those secondary electrons produce more electrons and then you have uh, you know the circuit gets completed and it sort of reaches an equilibrium uh, between uh, you know ionization and recombinations <clears throat> the role of cosmic rays is to produce a non negligible density of electrons in that uh, tube or even in in the atmosphere in fact, there are also these experiments. You know, I mean, if you go to these uh, like exhibitions and so on, where they have like an open day or something, they have this uh, counter. So whenever you have, uh, uh, so it sort of produces a spark or something. Whenever you have some ion, so that ionization that produces the spark is caused by cosmic rays. Okay. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, <clears throat> so the photo ionization cross section at 0.4 keV, which is X rays. Uh, is about. Uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 22 uh, centimeter squared. You recall uh, the photo ionization cross section was like few times 10 to the minus 18 close to the ionization potential, but it goes like new to the minus three. So at such high energies, it becomes somewhat low. Uh, and because of this, uh, for say 0 0.4 keV uh, X-ray photons can penetrate uh, a column, a, a neutral hydrogen column of about 2.5 times 10 to the 21, right? Uh, per centimeter squared. So, you know, this times this is one. Right? So that's about how big a neutral hydrogen column can X-ray photon penetrate before uh, being, you know, used up in ionization. <clears throat> 
So it turns out if you plug in the numbers and so on, in the ambient conditions, this is subdominant. X-ray ionization is subdominant. But if you are near uh, X-ray sources like AGN and uh, uh, other X-ray sources, then this can actually locally dominate. Otherwise, the, the flux of cosmic rays uh, is high enough that that number one dominates. <clears throat> So what matters is new you new, right? So what is new you new? At you know close to, uh, so if you're talking about 0.4 keV, then this close to 0.4 uh, keV. And the typical value in the ISM is about 10 to the minus 18 H new by 0 0.4 keV squared. So this is the kind. So this is new. You knew uh, is like energy density of photons uh, around that energy. Okay. So this is like the typical number. Uh, you can actually, you know, the thing to compare is the number. Uh, like you know, you, you divide this by h new, you get the number. So number density. So this is erg per centimeter cube. Uh, but you know, basically this needs to be compared with this zeta CR, and it turns out this is usually small. Okay, let's not go into the details. Okay, the third and the most important process for the heating of the IS uh, for the neutral ISM is photoelectric. Uh, heating by dust grains. <clears throat> and I, I already mentioned that um, the process is similar to photoelectric uh, heating of neutral hydrogen, uh, except that this happens below 13.6 EV. Uh, so let me actually write down the expression for this. So gamma, e, gamma is a uh, notation used for heating rate per unit volume, uh, generally divided by NH is about 1.4 times 10 to the minus 26 uh, erg per second. So if you multiply it by NH, that becomes erg per second per centimeter cube. Um, then you need number density of uh, photons with energy between 8 to 13.6 EV. 8 is like the work function for typical dust grains. You, you need photon energy which is higher than the work function in order for uh, photoelectrons to be produced. Divided by 3 times 10 to the minus 3 per centimeter cube. So this is photon uh, energy density uh, in this UV uh, UV energy density, and then you have sigma absorption, the cross section for absorption of UV by dust. This is about ten to the minus twenty one. Uh, right. So how do we get sigma absorption? You recall in the last lecture on dust, we talked about this absorption. And at uh, at smaller lambda, right, we reach this geometric limit where the cross section goes as phi a squared. You know, th there is this Rayleigh limit where cross section is smaller than the geometric limit, and at large uh, uh, grain sizes, it becomes the geometric limit. So this is roughly coming from that. Okay, you have to look at like you know, this is average over all dust sizes and all that. But if you put in the typical number, this is close to what it is. And then there are these other factors like yield. So how much of the energy uh, of the photoelectron goes into uh, heating? And, you know, 
Pc and Ev. So this EPE is the energy, can mean kinetic energy of the photoelectron. C is the energy of the uh, photon that was captured. So now these are some parameters, you know, don't bother too much about it. We have to just know this dependence, that it is really proportional to the number density of hydrogen uh, gas, uh, hydrogen gas, and proportional to the number density of photons at in the energy range of interest. OK, if you compare this with the cosmic rays, this is about a factor of few to 10 larger. So this was actually only this. So in the original uh, models, people only people thought that cosmic ray ionization was the dominant mechanism, me dominant heating model heating mechanism, but it turns out it's the photoelectric heating by dust. So this was sort of discovered in you know, 70s and 80s. OK, so these are the heating processes. So the general dependence is proportional to NH, right? the, uh, the heating rate per unit volume is proportional to the number density of the neutral gas. What about cooling? So cooling and heat, you know, we have actually done the same thing for H2 regions as well. It's the balance between heating and cooling which determine the temperature of that medium. So what are the important cooling mechanisms for uh, neutral, uh, neutral uh, ISM? So the cooling, so we are talking about gas between, you know, 100 or, you know, tens to 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So what are the uh, important cooling mechanisms? Can can this gas be cooled by Lyman alpha emission? So the Lyman alpha energy is about 10 EV, which is which is very high. So this this gas is uh, you know does not have enough thermal energy to excite the Lyman alpha line. OK, so this is uh, cooled by other line transitions. And what are those? Uh, C2. So in this gas, uh, carbon can actually be singly ionized. Carbon has a ionization potential which is lower than hydrogen. So in a region where hydrogen is neutral, carbon can be singly ionized right? because of uh, uh, because of photons which are less than 13.6 EV. So this is C2, 158 microns. So, <clears throat> so there's a singly ionized carbon. There is a fine structure line uh, transition that causes the uh, cooling of the uh, of the neutral gas. So the, the idea is the following, that you have a singly ionized carbon uh, and there are like collisions happening with this temperature in this temperature range. Those collisions have enough energy to excite, collisionally excite carbon in this state. And then it radiatively decays back and produces a photon of that energy. 158 micron, this lambda, if you convert to energy, it's very low compared to KT that you'll get in this temperature range, right? You know, my 100 micron is like way in the infrared. If you convert it into EV, it will come out to be very, very small. Uh, so th that that is like, uh, so this energy is less than uh, KT. So these can easily be excited by collisions. But this is not true for Lyman alpha transition. So collisions in the gas of this temperature cannot excite Lyman alpha. So, you know, it's predominantly neutral and also predominantly in the ground state of hydrogen, n equal to one state. OK, the, but the other uh, uh, coolant is oxygen one. That's also a fine structure line at uh, 63 microns. So th this is for the same reason. Uh, this is also uh, important. And both of these, uh, 
So oxygen has the almost the same ionization potential as hydrogen. So that's why oxygen is in neutral form. Because if you can ionize hydrogen, you can also ionize oxygen. So that's why this is O1 in the in the neutral ISM and not O2. <clears throat> the uh, other thing is that so there is this notion of N critical. There is a critical density which is defined as that if your density is higher than the critical density, then your de excitation of the excited state is dominated by collisions rather than by spontaneous decay. So if your collision, uh, if your density is higher than the critical density, you can suppress emission. Right? Because not all the transitions then are happening through the production of photons. Some of them just happen collisionally without the production of a photon. Uh, but the critical density for these transitions is uh, much higher. It's sort of few times 10 to the 3 per centimeter cube. So for typical densities and temperatures of the ISM, for the neutral ISM, these are not suppressed due to this effect. OK. Um, <clears throat> so, so co collisional uh, excitation uh, sort of balances uh, radiative uh, de excitation, which which produces these uh, fine structure lines. Okay. So let me actually now show the slides. There, I have actually used figures from the book. So here, uh, okay. So the yeah, the other thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, since these are two body processes, right? The, for the collisions, you need an electron or a, another um, atom or ion to sort of hit or you know come close to the hydrogen atom or to the C plus atom and excite it. It's a two body process. So the cooling rate, so this is lambda is sometimes used for uh, cooling rate, rate per unit volume, right? So it's proportional to number density squared, right? Because it's a two body process uh, times uh, a function which depends only on temperature, right? You know. The thermal velocity, cross sections, and so on uh, will go into this. So at higher, so the so the thing to notice is that the cooling, right? So the cooling goes like NH squared, whereas heating rate per unit volume goes as N. You see here, these are all proportional to N. You know, the NE is also proportional to NH for an X given XE. So the heating rate per unit volume is proportional to the number density, whereas the cooling rate per unit volume is proportional to density squared. So if you go to higher and higher densities, cooling wins over heating, but in most conditions, the gas is in thermal equilibrium. The rate at which it is getting cooled is equal to the rate at which it's getting heated. So if you reach a thermal equilibrium at higher densities, it will give you a lower temperature. Understand because you know at higher uh, if you go to higher densities, cooling lambda term dominates. So uh, so your equilibrium will be reached at lower temperatures. Okay, so let's go to what I. Uh, small lambda is the part that depends only on temperature. This is the density dependence because it's a two body. Uh, process, collisional process. OK, so this is that lambda over NH squared. So you have taken out the number density dependence and only sort of show the temperature dependence. So this is an erg centimeter cube per second, right? So if you multiply it by NH squared, what you'll get is lambda, which is erg per centimeter cube per second, which is heating rate per unit volume. OK, so this is how it looks like. 
as a function of temperature. So the, I, this is the range I was talking about, 10 to a 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Uh, the solid line gives you the total heating rate, including all the tra radiative transitions. And these dot dashed lines and dot dashed uh, lines give you contribution of individual ions and individual transitions. So for example, I told you that the C2 158 micron is a major coolant of the neutral plasma, uh, neutral gas. So, so you see the majority of cooling comes from C2. Right here, this is all due to C2. At slightly higher temperatures, O1 dominates. See that this energy is lower than that. So, at a, if you go to higher uh, temperatures, the higher energy excitations are accessible. Then this is silicon, singly ionized silicon. This is singly, uh, this is neutral oxygen. Now here you see, as soon as you cross like five, six thousand Kelvin, this Lyman alpha shoots up. In fact, this is not even shown here. And the reason it shoots up is at that about that energy, the atoms have enough energy to excite this n equal to one to n equal to two transition, uh, which can collisionally get excited and get de-excited by emission of Lyman alpha photon. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, few, few, few thousand Kelvin is good enough. See, that's the thing. That's where you are forgetting about the degeneracy factor. If you look at the Saha ionization equation, you get about ionization fraction of a half, not at the ionization potential, but at so 6,000 Kelvin. And the reason for that is that there is a, a factor of uh, 2 pi uh, me kt to the 3 by 2 divided by h cube. You know, I, when I was actually doing this class on the board, I had actually mentioned that uh, because of this uh, huge space uh, present for free electrons in phase space, uh, all you have to do is ionize one uh, one neutral hydrogen and that electron has such a large uh, space in the phase space to go to that even at low uh, lower energies than the ionization potential you can have significant uh, ionization right so although what so this is related if you have uh, so if you convert 10 ev to temperature that's about 10 to the 5 uh, kelvin but that's not enough so you can actually have this significantly enhanced uh, even at low uh, energies because of uh, factors like those. OK, so these are two different conditions. <clears throat> the same curve shown for two different conditions. This is point. So neutral hydrogen density of 0 0.6 cent per centimeter cube and Xe electron to hydrogen number density ratio of 0 0.017. S Whereas this is even higher density and lower ionization uh, fraction. So in this case, uh, it sort of changes a little bit. Oxygen is dominant even at uh, sort of somewhat lower temperatures, but the, uh, the qualitative picture remains the same. Um, OK, so. So for mostly I, so you can actually see this is mostly neutral, right? This is uh, 0 0.017, 0 0.01 ionization and very small ionization. So in that mostly neutral gas, these are dominant coolants. In fact, a lot of uh, lot of observational mission, observational programs try to observe C2 line. To C2 line is sometimes used as a tracer for star formation because all the energy produced by star formation eventually is reprocessed this through this uh, C2 uh, line emission. OK, so this is it. So we have actually talked about uh, heating. And I said that photoelectric heating due to grains is the major heating uh, source. I We talked about cooling, and here are these lines, which are the major coolants of the uh, neutral ISM. Now the next step is to actually balance them. 
So heating is equal to cooling. Thermal equilibrium is reached on a cooling time scale, which is fairly short. So we expect a lot of this uh, gas to be in uh, thermal equilibrium. OK, um, so heating rate per unit volume is a function of density and temperature, right? There's a temperature dependence which is shown here on the, the x-axis, and the density dependence is NH squared. And the cooling rate uh, and the heating rate is NH times some other functions of temperature, right? If you balance the two out, uh, you get curves like this. So, so, so these are curves of thermal equilibrium for neutral ISM. This solid line. You know, you have these functional forms of heating rate per unit volume and cooling rate per unit volume. And if you just equate the two for every n and t, you get a curve like this. On this curve, heating balances cooling for that given n and t. Um, if you are on the right of this curve, that is, if you are at a higher density at the same temperature, your cooling wins. Right, because cooling goes like n squared. So this, so on this part of the phase space, cooling dominates. This part of the phase space, heating dominates. Uh, so this solid curve is the equilibrium uh, curve. This assumes uh, cosmic ray ionization of, uh, you know, cosmic ray, uh, primary cosmic ray ionization rate of this much. Uh, it assumes an interstellar, uh, radiation field given by this paper. You know, these are all technical things. We don't really have to get into that. Uh, and it assumes dust photoelectric heating from this model. We don't really have to get into that. But the point is you get a curve like this. Uh, these solid lines, the, these dashed lines here are curves of constant pressure. N times T equals constant. This is a log log plot. So it will be a straight line of slope minus one. So this corresponds to a pressure of 2700 centimeter cube Kelvin, right? Pressure, when you just write it as N times T and just ignore the KB Boltzmann factor, it the units are just per centimeter cube Kelvin. Right? So this is 2700 per centimeter cube Kelvin. So you can actually think of it as Say uh, the gas density is say 0.27 particles per centimeter cube, and a temperature of 10 to the four. And the, the product of that will give you 2,700. Uh, similarly, this one is at 4,300. You know, if you at the same density, if you go to higher temperature, the pressure is higher, right? P is n k t. Uh, now, why have we marked these two lines? We have marked these two lines. The, the reason actually can actually be seen on the curve on the right. So, th so this is in the temperature density space, but you can also do the same thing in temperature pressure space, right? Because if you know N and T, pressure is known because pressure is just NT. So if you do that, uh, this is the, I mean, this is the equilibrium curve, the same curve drawn in this uh, space. Now, it sort of what it shows is that this temp in this pressure range, there are three phases, equilibrium phases. These are the three equilibrium phases for neutral ISM. This one, this one, and this one. Okay, so if you if you uh, if you have this N and T. The gas can sit there happily because it's in uh, thermal equilibrium. But it turns out that this point is an unstable equilibrium. How do we see that? Um, so you assume, like you sort of imagine that you you take this, uh, you take plasma or the gas from here and say move it a little bit on the, to, towards the bottom, right? Here, cooling wins. Right. So the other thing that we are assuming in this exercise is that we are perturbing the system isobarically. Uh, basically, the 
sound speed is so fast that there are no pressure fluctuations. When you are doing these perturbations, you are doing it slow compared to the sound crossing time. So these processes are effectively isobaric. So if you if you bring your fluid element away from equilibrium here, it it has net cooling. Why? Because it is going to lower temperatures. Lower temperatures isobarically means higher densities. Right? Lower temperature, higher densities because NT is constant when you're doing this perturbation. So higher densities mean meaning cooling winds over heating. So if cooling winds over heating, temperature has to go down. If the temperature goes down, density goes up. Uh, so it has a tendency to go down, go away from this equilibrium point. Similarly, if you perturb it in the other direction, it has a tendency to, to go away from this equilibrium. These are these are, this is unstable phase. You can maintain equilibrium at that. It's sort of like, you know, if you have a pendulum like this, this is an equilibrium, right? But it's an unstable equilibrium. If you leave it, it has a it has a runaway. In the same sense, uh, this phase is an unstable phase. Whereas here, if you do the same exercise, uh, if you if you perturb a fluid element from here to here, isobarically, your here heating winds, right? So you have you have lowered the temperature in the perturbation, but heating winds, so it brings it back to to this uh, stable branch. So that's why, because of this generic nature of this uh, curve of uh, thermal equilibrium, you expect these two phases to be predominant phases of the warm neutral medium. Okay, is it clear? It's a very important uh, concept, uh, sort of a classic thing about uh, the interstellar medium. And these sort of curves depend on all those, like, you know, uh, gamma PE had some temperature dependence. Uh, similarly, uh, lambda had the temperature dependence and density dependence. So all that goes in this. Right. So here we are assuming that uh, uh, we are we are not looking at self gravitating gas. So we are assuming that the density is small enough that self gravity of gas is not important. Uh, as well as yes, exactly. And even magnetic pressure, because when we are doing it isobarically, we are assuming that the gas pressure of the two phases is equal. So yeah, it's a sort of a fairly simple minded model, but it's a very influential model. Um, and it sort of looks very like, you know, it has an appeal because it sort of has a theoretical uh, underpinning. Uh, in fact, uh, you do find gas in this temperature. So, you know, if you take this uh, figure liter you know, literally, what this would say is that, oh, you should rarely see gas between 100. 300 Kelvin to uh, 3000 Kelvin. But you do see, if you look at the 21 centimeter observations, you do see gas in this temperature range. So what that means is that the ISM is not as simple as just thermal equilibrium between these two static processes. So if you have turbulence, for example, turbulence can bring gas at intermediate temperatures, even though there is a tendency to go towards these uh, stable phases. So it's complicated, but this is like the, uh, you know, a useful paradigm. Now there are these two phases, but there's also a third phase of the interstellar medium. And the third phase of the interstellar medium is hot at about 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So you have this phase, which is roughly at 100 Kelvin. You have this other phase, which is at about 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin. And the third phase, which is at 10 to the 6 Kelvin. And this hot phase is maintained due to supernovae going off in the interstellar medium. Supernovae launches these uh, launch these uh, strong blast waves, and it raises the temperature of the gas which is encountered by the supernovae. Uh, formally, that phase is thermally unstable, and it it 
if you perturb it, it has a tendency to run away. But since it's a low density gas, the hot gas is a low density gas with a long cooling time. See, uh, cooling rate per unit volume goes like n squared. If the hot phase is low density, its cooling time can be long, so it may not reach equilibrium. So it, it can be out of equilibrium in the sense of uh, thermal equilibrium. OK, 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 let's go back. So this is about uh, neutral uh, gas. Uh, what about molecular gas? like H2, uh, molecular hydrogen is the dominant uh, uh, molecular species because hydrogen is the dominant uh, atom present in the ISF. So, <clears throat> so again, I'll actually not be going into uh, great details, uh, but I'll just sort of mention things. So there are two ways in which, so whenever we are talking, we are talking about chemical equilibrium, right? So ionization recombination is we are sort of thinking of it as a chemical uh, sort of process forward and backward direction. Similarly, for molecular gas, you will have formation of molecules and destruction of molecules, right? Uh, molecules form where, you know, by, by two uh, main processes. So one is a gas phase uh, uh, you know, gas phase uh, process in which, uh, so you have a hydrogen atom and you have an electron coming together. It gives you H minus uh, plus H nu. It forms a uh, hydrogen with two electrons. Okay, it's sort of a, uh, this is called radiative association. You know, we are again doing same sort of chemistry type things, uh, radiative association, and then you can have this H minus, which is produced here, uh, colliding with neutral hydrogen, producing H2, which is in some excited vibrational and rotational level. Just like, you know, we have, when have, we have recombination, the, the hydrogen that's produced can be in an excited state, and then it can radiatively cascade down to produce a lot of uh, H beta, H alpha type photons. So you have this, and then you have uh, production of electron, and you have kinetic energy. So, so this is an exothermic reaction. That's sort of obvious because H minus is not very stable. Right? It does not, hydrogen, a proton does not want two electrons. Uh, <clears throat> And this is called associative detachment. <laughs> the words are actually quite interesting. So associative detachment. So it has associated with hydrogen and now it has detached from electron. But you know, the point is all these micro uh, steps, these chemical reactions, so to speak, are extremely important and they're distinct, but very similar to each other. So this is sort of, you know, if you've done chemical kinetics, right, there are, uh, you you look at the, the rate coefficient and see how it depends on the concentration of this species and so on, and you try to figure out the molecular mechanism of that reaction. In the same way here, the molecular me mechanism can actually be quite complicated. Uh, so this is in the, the gas phase reaction which produces H2, molecular hydrogen. This is actually fairly slow, okay? But this is the only, this is the fastest process in the early universe. Because the second process that I'm gonna talk about is grain catalysis. So in the early universe, there was no dust. There was no dust, there were no dust grains. So this grain catalysis does not work, even though it's more efficient in the present day conditions. So what happens in grain catalysis is you have a dust grain and you have some neutral hydrogen 
and it sort of collides and you know is uh, stick it sticks on the dust grain but it has enough energy that it sort of diffuses on this dust grain okay and you know it can actually get trapped in some region or something the chemistry of this this, this is like surface chemistry it's extremely complicated now if you have a hydrogen which is diffusing on this uh, dust grain and if you have another hydrogen which comes and starts doing the same there is a non negligible probability that they can come together and form so this is the dust grain form h2 formation of h2 so if you combine h and h to form h2 uh, it releases kinetic energy it releases about uh, 4.5 ev and that energy is enough for it to get ejected right h2 is much less massive than the dust grain that energy in this uh, process is shared mostly you know is taken mostly by the lower mass guy which is h2 and just it flies out as soon as h2 molecule forms the newly formed uh, molecule just leaves the grain because it has that extra uh, kinetic energy so this is what the microphysics of dust uh, grain catalysis is supposed to be <clears throat> so th this gas phase uh, reaction is more important at high redshifts where there is no dust. So the first stars, in order to form first stars, you have to have molecules, right? Without molecules, how can you, you know, increase the density of the gas? So that uh, must have happened through these kind of reactions so you can actually write a re reaction rate so ddt of n h2 due to grains is equal to r gr times n h times n h um let's see uh So this is a uh, rate coefficient uh, and this is about half 8 kt over pi mh this is just the thermal velocity right times epsilon gr times sigma gr uh, so let's see um, so this sort of looks like v thermal times a cross section area uh, and this is some sort of a um <clears throat> this is basically uh So efficiency to form H2, this is dimensionless. So basically, if you have a, uh, you know, the probability of these two hydrogen random walking on the dust grain and combining and leaving as uh, H2 molecule, is, is all that messy physics goes into this uh, factor, epsilon gr. So then this is sort of average over all grain sizes and properties and whatnot. These uh, are representing that. So the unit of this is uh, centimeter cube per second, right? Since this is per centimeter cube, this is also per centimeter cube. So this gives you the volume rate, so rate of production of H2 molecules per unit volume uh, is given on the left. So, you know, these look very, very similar. It's like a recombination alpha the combination coefficient <clears throat> right so good question actually 
they are different, but my sort of, I mean, they're very, very similar. I think they are related to the fact that, uh, right, so normally when you use NH, this includes all the, uh, so it includes protons, uh, it includes neutral hydrogen, and it includes H2. But in this sort of a gap, uh, you know, I, I think this is uh, indeed different from this. But in these conditions, when you don't have a lot of molecules and when when almost all of it is neutral, they are almost the same. This formula is for general conditions. Okay. Uh, but for us, it's just NH squared. And I think the reason to distinguish in, between these two is related to the microphysics of how this actually happens. Um, okay, so these are the ways in which you can form molecular hydrogen, but you can also destroy molecular. So you must have noticed a pattern that you have things which create some things, and then there are uh, processes which destroy something, you know, uh, processes which heat something, so the gas, and processes which cool the gas, and we have equilibrium eventually. The same ideas will follow here. Uh, what what will uh, what will destroy hydrogen molecules? So that is photo dissociation of H two molecules. So uh, so basically, you have hydrogen molecule and you have a photon, and that has enough energy but you know we are so we always consider a photon with energy less than 13.6 eV because if you have greater than 13.6 eV the neutral hydrogen atoms are there and they will just take it up like crazy if you are below 13.6 eV then neutral hydrogen says oh no i don't really care you just go on your way so but hydrogen molecules uh, can get broken at uh, at lower energy. And this is how so this is H plus H plus kinetic energy. <clears throat> so these photons, which can dissociate hydrogen molecule, uh, but not ionize hydrogen, are called Lyman band photons or Lyman Werner. Continuum, no, not continuum. Lyman Werner band. So basically, instead of a line, it's sort of a broad band in which it can absorb. <clears throat> so I'm actually not going to go into the mathematical treatment here, but let me actually just say, uh, right. So, right. So, so in equal. So again, we are we are. A, Approaching the same theme, equilibrium. So, the production and destruction of molecular hydrogen will also reach equilibrium. Uh, so, this process and the grain catalysis or the gas phase formation of molecular hydrogen will reach equilibrium. And what we have is C dissociation times NH2, right? So this zeta is always uh, rate. It's like Einstein A, probability per unit time. This is number density is equal to the grain. So this is like recombination, two body process. So RGR times NH times NH. So this is what happens in equilibrium. So we assume that the grain mechanism is the key mechanism for producing uh, molecular hydrogen and photo dissociation by photons of energy less than 13.6 and greater than say you know 10 eV or something uh, dominates the dissociation of uh, hydrogen molecules um, okay so let me actually put down the numbers. So if you plug in the numbers for this zeta, this, and RGR, what you get is NH2 by NH, which is equal to RGR. In equilibrium, this is equal to RGR by zeta, this. This stands for 
dissociation is about 10 2 times 10 to the minus 5. So for fiducial conditions, it's only 2 times 10 to the minus 5. The number density of hydrogen molecule to hydrogen atom is about 2 times 10 to the five, uh, minus 5. And if I put in the normalization, this is 30 for a centimeter cube. Uh, R, G, R, this grain recombination coefficient is 3 times 10 to the minus 17 centimeter cube per second times 5 times 10 to the minus 11 per second by theta this. The, the, the values with which these are normalized are typical ISM conditions. Right, so if your flux of these photons, which can dissociate new uh, hydrogen molecule, uh, is about a typical value, and if this is the this is atomic, you know, this is this is grain sort of hydrogen atom interaction physics. This is uh, hydrogen number density. So what do you say is that in normal neutral uh, ISM, the abundance of molecules is extremely small. Uh, molecule abundance is tiny. So now the question is, how do you create molecular clouds? If this is the case in typical ISM conditions, how can we create molecular clouds which are mostly molecules? And the answer to that is something called Self shielding. So, what does self shielding mean? So, self shielding means is that uh, you have these uh, dissociating photons. Okay, if you have an enough enough high column, so what what you're trying to do is, uh, so you have these, you know, Lyman Werner uh, photons which are trying to break uh, molecular uh, bonds. But if you have enough column of dust and uh, molecular hydrogen, then all those photons are absorbed within that column. Here, beyond a certain column, this gas here is shielded. Here, in the optical depth uh, of this column is large that nothing, essentially nothing is all right. So e to the minus tau nu is what, what gets transmitted. If you have high enough column here of molecular hydrogen and dust, then this region can get shielded. And effectively there, your this uh, uh, zeta disk becomes extremely small. If this becomes small, then your fraction can can get increased, right? So that sort of is the idea of um, self shielding. So I'm actually not going to go, do the mathematics, uh, but let me actually show you uh, how the structure of a photo dissociation region looks like uh, here. So photo dissociation region. So let's see. So there is a massive star here, an O star ray. It creates an H2 region, the Stromgren sphere. Okay, so this dashed line here represents the H2 region. So within this ionization front, hydrogen is all ionized, oxygen is all ionized. Outside this, hydrogen is neutral, oxygen. So uh, this UV radiation is between uh you know 10 to 13.6 ev right everything which is greater than 13.6 ev is absorbed within h2 region this is still uv radiation it sort of moves so what this uv radiation does is it ionizes carbon for example magnesium uh it can heat the gas. So, you know, there are various things here. So T gas, as so H2 region is roughly at 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Okay. As you move in, in this neutral gas, thermal equilibrium follows. So I drew those thermal equilibrium curves, right? There are two stable phases, 
10 to the you know 5000 kelvin and you know few hundred kelvin so this is uh this is 6000 kelvin this is the the lower density high temperature phase this is the high density low temperature phase uh, this is roughly in pressure equilibrium throughout n times t is constant because the sound crossing time is very uh, short so it's it's in rough pressure balance um, so at some point so this so so here uh, hydrogen is mostly neutral carbon is c plus at some point you start forming h2 molecules the column of this is high enough that this zeta factor that i was talking about photo dissociation factor inside this has become in small enough that the equilibrium abundance of h2 can become uh, can become half or more than half so this is the dissociation front. So this is ionization front, boundary of the H2 region. This is the dissociation front beyond which you can have hydrogen in molecular form uh, at about 100 Kelvin. This shows tau, optical depth. Uh, this is in UV, in, in basically uh, this Lyman-Werner band. So, so here it's sort of zero. All the Lyman-Werner photons from here can easily come out. Here it becomes uh, order unity. And as you go deeper and deeper, uh, you know, the optical depth becomes bigger and bigger. And, you know, XH2, the, the fraction of uh, hydrogen in molecular form becomes larger and larger. This is called a photo dissociation region. OK, so. Stromgren sphere followed by a photo dissociation region with a range of temperatures. And then if you have enough high enough column, you will have molecular uh, cloud, which is uh, mostly molecules. Uh, so there's a lot of chemistry happening uh, here. This is tau UV and this is NH. They are proportional to each other. Okay. Optical depth is proportional to column. So higher the column, you can self shield. So this, so you basically what it means is you need a column of at least 10 to the 21 uh, neutral hydrogen uh, in order for you to self shield and be able to form molecules you cannot form molecules here because the equilibrium in equilibrium conditions the abundance of h2 here is like 10 to the minus 6 that's not a molecular uh, gas this is where it forms molecules in the uh, photo you know across the photo dissociation front so here is basically profile of various things like number density, temperature, and electron fraction as a function of column or as a function of X. Uh, so on the left here, so we are sort of essentially starting at about 5000 Kelvin. So this is where we are starting. So this is the temperature. You know, it's still a few thousand Kelvin and it suddenly goes to 100 Kelvin. This is the signature of that thermal instability that there is this unstable phase at intermediate temperature. The gas does not want to be there. So it's either a few thousand Kelvin or a few hundred Kelvin. This is hydrogen number density. N times T is constant. They are in rough pressure balance. So lower density, higher temperature, higher density, lower temperature. This is the point, which is this front, dissociation front. This is where... Uh, so just like in Stromgren sphere, there is a steady state between photo dissociation and formation of uh, H2 molecules at every point. Uh, and this is done in a frame in which the photo dissociation front is in rest, is at rest. Um, this is about few times, right? So this is... 10 to the 21 column of uh, hydrogen. Uh, this is where it sort of the ionization fraction uh, or the molecular fraction becomes half. So this is this vertical line here, dotted line, is this uh, front. This is about few hundred Kelvin. Yeah. And this is where uh, this is NH2 by NH. So 
till here, as I said, in the typical ISM conditions, the, the ratio of NH2 to NH is like 10 to the minus 6. Here, the, there will be molecules, but their abundance is 10 to the minus 6. Because as soon as you cross this thin region, so this region, which is sort of exaggerated here, is very thin in actual calculation, right? So you see, it shows 1000 Kelvin and this big space here. That is very tiny in real space or in column. So that all, you know, basically there's a transition from neutral hydrogen to atomic hydrogen, uh, neutral hydrogen atoms to molecular hydrogen very, very quickly. So this is called a photo dissociation region uh, or a PDR. So uh, the ideas are actually very, very similar to a H2 region. It's an equilibrium. You know, this the same theme has been recurring in various places, right? Ionization recombination or chemistry or whatever are in equilibrium. And then, you know, you reach a state. So every point is in equilibrium, but you reach a state uh, with different abundances because of uh, different processes, different conditions. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So that was about neutral parts of the interstellar medium, atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen, and CO and all those will also form. Just like in H2 regions, you can talk about uh, ionization fraction of oxygen, carbon, magnesium, and so on. You can talk about uh, formation of CO molecules and other molecules, same ideas of equilibrium apply. Now, now we are going to talk about cooling and heating of the hot phase. So we talked about uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin phase, H2 regions. We talked about neutral phase, uh, 100 to uh, 2000 Kelvin gas. What about 10 to the 6 Kelvin gas? I told you there's a lot of gas in the ISM, which is at 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So this gas, which is hot, is in the condition of collisional ionization equilibrium. Again, equilibrium, but of a different kind. So what is collisional ionization equilibrium? Uh, this gas at 10 to the 6 Kelvin is fully ionized, right? You know, uh, Saha equation tells us that it should be fully ionized. Uh, so hydrogen is fully ionized, but uh, ion, atoms like iron has such a high ionization potential to remove all the electrons from uh, iron. So iron has 50, uh, 26 electrons. So if you want to uh, remove the last electron from an iron ion, you would read Z squared times the times 13.6, right? So And Z is 26. So you know, 26 squared times 13.6 you know, sends you in X-rays. So uh, it's very high energy. Uh, the ionization potential is very high. So iron can actually be, uh, need not be fully, ion uh, fully ionized even at somewhat high temperatures like 10 to the 7 Kelvin. Okay, so this, what is shown here is cooling rate uh, normalized to this N squared or N E times N H. This lambda is, Erg per centimeter cube per second. Right? The, the rate uh, the rate at which the hot gas cools per unit volume per unit time is lambda. But you normalize it to any NH because cooling is also here a two-body process. So the dependence on density is just N squared. So if you normalize it to this, you get something called a cooling function. This lambda by any NH is called a cooling function. And it only depends on temperature in collisional ionization equilibrium conditions. So, so what is collisional ionization equilibrium? So you have electrons and ions and atoms, they're colliding. Uh, the collision excites the atom or ion to a, uh, a higher excited state, and it radiatively de-excites and produced a, produces a photon, which loses the energy. Uh, so there is an equilibrium between collisional excitation and radiative decay. So unlike an H2 region where uh, excitation is not collisional, but radiative excitation, right? You know, it's the 
is the Lyman continuum photon, which excites uh, NH2 region and then they recombine. It's sort of a, uh, this is different. Um, because the temperature is so high that you know no star can can uh, you know ionize iron for example this is all thermal because of high temperature of this plasma okay so this is radiative cooling function lambda over nenh for solar abundance plasma in collisional ionization equilibrium computed with the chianti code so this is like a typical plasma code there's also something called cloudy sort of a similar code uh, with which you can actually do these uh, ionization equilibrium calculations and calculate these cooling functions. Um, these dashed lines are just simple uh, polynomial fits, you know, power law fits. Okay. Um, this is the same thing, the cooling function, as a function of temperature, but for different metallicities. So this zero is. Uh, only hydrogen and helium. And as you increase the metallicity from 0 to 0 0.01 solar, 0 0.1 solar, 0 0.2 solar, half solar, one solar, and twice solar, in this intermediate temperature range, you get enhanced cooling. And the reason you get this enhanced cooling is because of different metal, uh, metal ions like oxygen, uh, carbon, uh, silicon and iron so these are metal lines these bumps that you see here are due to uh, radiative excitation and de excitation of metal uh, abundant metal uh, species here with zero you have these two peaks one and two these are recombination peaks so this is due to helium helium here has an ionization uh, you know helium becomes fully ionized at requires 54.4 EV. That's the second ionization potential of helium. Uh, beyond that, uh, yeah, so this is this bump is due to helium. Uh, so at this temperature, about 10 to the 5 Kelvin, it's the excitation of helium by collisions and radiative decay that dominates. This is just Lyman alpha. Uh, Right, so I had actually shown this. This H Lyman alpha here. This is 10 to the 4 Kelvin, recall. Now what we are seeing is beyond 10 to the 4. That this bump that comes here is due to that Lyman alpha, which was subdominant at lower temperatures. Uh, this is due to helium, carbon, oxygen, iron, and so on. Uh, this part is radiation due to free free emission right you know at very high temperatures everything is fully ionized and what you have if you have such a hot plasma it will just undergo bremsstrahlung rate you know cooling uh, and here these hot plasmas are so dilute that whenever a photon is born it just leaves it, it is optically thin okay so this uh, is under the optically thin uh, limit So here I had actually just written that this is optical. So when uh, when is CIE valid? Collisional ionization equilibrium is valid when you are in the optically thin limit. The density is not very high. Uh, there is no photo ionization, no excitation due to photons, but it's all collisional. So there is a uh, balance between collisional ionization and radiative uh, recombination. And we are assuming equilibrium. This equilibrium between collisional excitation and radiative uh, recombination need not hold. So, for example, if you have a shock passing through the gas, the time scale over which a shock passes is very short compared to recombination time. So, in those conditions, the gas need not be in equilibrium. It can be out of equilibrium. Okay, and it it can be over ionized. Uh, because it has not had time to recombine. So you can have those conditions in uh, shocks. The other thing to notice is that these ion lines, these uh, metal lines, increase with metallicity. That's that's sort of expected. If you have more oxygen, you have more lines of oxygen which can take away more energy from the plasma. 
the free free emission emissivity goes like t to the one half. This is well known. <clears throat> this hot gas is actually pretty uh, pretty pervasive in the interstellar medium. It's caused by supernovae. Beyond the interstellar medium, there is a hot atmosphere around galaxies called the circumgalactic medium. Galaxy clusters have uh, most of their baryons in this intracluster medium, which is at 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin. So a lot of these processes are important for those uh, systems. In some sense, the hot phase is simpler than the cooler phases because they don't have very complicated chemistry and you know things like you know, random walk of hydrogen atom on dust veins. They are extremely complicated, complex processes. Here, uh, the physical processes are relatively simple. You have like optically thin conditions and all that. So it's easier to treat. This is also cleaner. All right, so if you look at this cooling curve and if you break it down into contribution from different atoms, right? We did the same thing, right? When we had the cooling function for the neutral uh, ISM, we broke it down into C2 fine structure cooling, oxygen one fine structure line, silicon line, and so on. Similarly here, you can break down the cooling function into, so at this temperature, I said it's hydrogen which cools at about this temperature due to Lyman alpha. This is hydrogen, this is uh, helium, this is helium. Uh, this is carbon. So this peak is actually due to carbon. This is for solar metallicity. <clears throat> this is due to oxygen. This little bump here is due to neon. This is due to iron. And this is also due to iron. Right? Because iron has a higher ionization potential. It will dominate at higher temperatures. Uh, this is due to hydrogen and this is due to helium. This is just free free uh, part. Once everything is ionized, it's the hydrogen and helium which dominate free free because they have more uh, more abundance. So they, these kind of curves are produced by these codes like Chianti and Cloudy. Okay. You can calculate a cooling time. Cooling time is nothing but the internal energy density, which is just three half times pressure for an ideal hot you know, plasma or hot gas, three half NKT divided by any Ni times lambda. You know, this is F cool or small lambda. I mean, previously, instead of F cool, I had used a small uh, letter lambda. It's the same thing. This is cooling rate, which is just a function of temperature. And you can actually see this is inversely proportional to density, right? This is N here, and there's N squared here. See, uh, this plasma is more or less fully ionized, right? So N, and let's assume this is hydrogen plasma. So Ne is just N by 2. NH is also N by 2. But N is total number of particles, number density of particles. So N is equal to Ne plus NH if you just have hydrogen plasma. So this is just like 1 by N uh, kind of a number. So higher the density, shorter is the cooling time. And it goes for a given temperature, it goes like 1 over N. So that's why if you plot N times T cool, this should be only a function of temperature, right? Because you have taken, so this N and this N cancels, and if you take this N on that side, it's just only a function of temperature because F cool is a function of temperature. This is F cool. So, So these are for different metallicities. So this is for zero metallicity. This is three times solar metallicity. And you know, the higher the metallicity, shorter is the cooling time. That's also understandable because plasma is cooling more efficiently uh, in presence of these metals. Um, so if we assume an NH of order, so you know, hot gas density. So let's put in the ICM numbers, the intracluster medium density is roughly like, you know, highest ICM density is about 0.1 particles per cc. That's the innermost part. So if you put 0.1 here uh, and you 
take the plasma temperature to be say 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Uh, so this is about 10 to the 7 years, right? 10 mega years. So if you make it by 0.1, it becomes 10 to the 8 years, which is 100 mega years. So that's roughly the cooling time of the core of uh, the intracluster medium. So this is just cooling is actually extremely important in mm -hmm. astrophysics. The range of mass of galaxies is actually determined by uh, the cooling time of the gas in the halos. If the cooling time of the gas which have uh, collapsed into halos is short, it can form stars very efficiently. So all these concepts, this microphysics of atomic physics is very, very important <coughs> in determining macro things like the mass range of galaxies. So you have to keep that in mind. We, we haven't really covered that portion so much in this course, uh, but it's one of the important themes of modern galaxy formation. Have you covered shocks? Have you done shocks in some other course? So you know uh, you know the non-radiative shocks, the Rankine Hugonio jump conditions. You guys know? No. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's actually quickly cover shocks. So shocks, shocks. Uh, so you know we talked about the cooling mechanism for hot gas. What about the heating mechanism? We haven't talked about the heating mechanism. The hot gas, the hot phase, uh, cannot be heated by photoelectric effect and all that, right? You know, everything is ionized. You know, where are photoelectrons? So, hot phase is typically heated by mechanical injection of energy. So, shocks is one of those uh, examples uh, through which you can heat the gas. If you have gas, if you pass a shock through it, it can irreversibly heat the gas, uh, okay. <sighs> and there are shocks of all, all sorts. There are, uh, you know, there are non-radiative or sometimes erroneously called adiabatic uh, shocks. Shocks are not adiabatic. You know, at shocks you generate entropy, so they are not adiabatic. That's why I said erroneously. So non-radiative shocks. This is where this Rankine uh, Hugoniot jump condition applies. And then you have radiative shocks. These radiative shocks happen in high density. Uh, density conditions where cooling is important. Okay. And then very, very important are collision-less shocks. In fact, most of the shocks in diffuse hot phase are collision-less. They are not uh, the shock transition doesn't happen because of collisions, but because of plasma instability. Okay. And then there are uh, ionization shocks. So, so across shocks, shock across, so suppose you have molecular gas, right? You have H2 molecular hydrogen at 10 Kelvin and the shock passes through it. It can get ionized it will be dissociated, it can get ionized and so on. So there's a lot of chemistry happening in addition to a lot of heating and thermodynamics. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll not cover these two, but I'll actually just sketch these two. I will actually not go through details of it because that's sort of a class in its own. And I want to be done in 10 minutes at max. Okay, um, so... Let's talk about uh, Rankine Hugonio uh, or, or non radiative shocks. So, when are shocks produced? So, shocks are produced when you, when you deposit a lot of energy in a small volume 
in a very short time, right? So you know, you you even explosions, right? You know, if you have uh, TNT and you if you burn a lot of TNT in a confined region, it will launch, you know, a shock or an explosion. Okay, so shocks are produced when you deposit a lot of energy in a small volume in a short time. So you can produce it by uh, chemical reactions, like in an explosion. You can produce shocks in a nuclear explosion where you deposit a lot of energy in a small volume in a short time. You can produce it in astrophysical processes like supernovae. You know, suddenly you deposit 10 to the 51 ergs in the ISM in a short time and it launches a shock. So, uh, <clears throat> so whenever you have something happening very fast and you're depositing a lot of energy, shocks are formed. Uh, so a shock is like a discontinuity in conditions. And so you have upstream region and you have a downstream region. And this upstream and downstream are segregated by the shock front, which is drawn here in red. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so what you do is a lot of these calculations are done in shock rest frame. So shock fra rest frame is the frame which is moving with this discontinuity. So the lab frame, so for example, in a supernova explosion, the supernova forward shock moves in the interstellar medium. So in the lab frame, which is the frame in which ISM is at rest, uh, the shock is actually moving. But the equations that I'm going to write are not valid in the lab frame. They are valid in the frame in which the shock is moving. So this you have to be very mindful of. The frame is important. All these equations that I'm going to write here are valid in the shock rest frame. Why? Because in the shock rest frame, this is zero. Partial by partial T is zero. In the shock rest frame, you know, you have upstream flow coming in, it slows down and forms a downstream flow. Uh, so upstream is indicated by one and downstream is indicated traditionally by two. So <clears throat> only in this frame, the shock frame, you don't have any variation in time. If you are in the lab frame and if the shock is moving, right, the conditions here as the shock pass have changed. So you cannot apply Dow by Dow T is zero. Only in the shock rest frame, you can say that nothing is changing with time. The material from upstream is moving, crosses the shock and changes its conditions behind the shock, but the shock is at rest. And as soon as it crosses, it sort of reaches the conditions in the downstream region. So Dow by Dow T, nothing changes at any place in, in time. OK, that's a steady condition. So what are the equations? Uh, we have the conserve. So we have the fluid dynamics equation. This is the mass conservation in 1D. So we are assuming a planar geometry. And uh, we are assuming a steady state. So this is mass conservation equation, uh, momentum conservation equation. So you have not done fluids course, is it? it? This has to be covered in the fluids course. It was done, no? Uh, so the people who said we don't know haven't taken fluids course. Is that the idea? Hmm? So, it, but it was covered in the fluids course. Okay. So let's, yeah, let me. So half rho u squared plus p by gamma minus one. Uh, plus dot of x half rho u squared plus gamma p by gamma minus one times u is equal to zero. So these are fluid equations or the Euler equations in the conservative form, right? We are writing it as dou by dou t of the density of a conserved quantity plus divergence of a flux is equal to zero, right? So this is mass density, this is momentum density, and this is total energy density. 
there is kinetic energy and there is thermal energy or internal energy. Now, dou by dou t is zero. So <clears throat> these equations, these differential equations apply everywhere except at this discontinuity, which is the shock. At the shock, you cannot take a derivative. You know, if you have a discontinuity, you cannot take a derivative there. So the idea there is you integrate it over across this discontinuity. Right? So you get a jump condition. Uh, so this is anyway zero. You know, density, momentum density, total energy density do not change in time. Right. So the jump, you know, so basically what you have is rho u. 1 to 2. So rho u downstream minus rho u upstream is equal to 0. That's what this steady state and integration across the shock jump gives you. Similarly, rho u squared plus p, the jump. So rho u squared plus p evaluated in 2, which is the downstream, minus rho u squared plus p evaluated in upstream is equal to 0. Similarly, half rho u squared plus gamma p by gamma minus 1 times u, the jump in this is 0. Right? So, you know, if you write it as rho 1, u 1, you will do rho 2, u 2. This is just the first equation. So rho 1, u 1 squared plus p 1 equals rho 2, u 2 squared plus p 2. This is the second equation half rho 1 u1 squared plus gamma by gamma minus 1 uh, p1 times u1 is equal to half rho 2 u2 squared plus gamma by gamma minus 1 uh, p2 times u2. Basically, this is an area in which I research on, so I don't really need anything for this. Um, uh, <clears throat> And if you have any questions about shocks ever, uh, you can you know come and talk to me. I think I will be able to help you. Uh, okay, so you have this mass, this mass, momentum, energy conservation. Uh, so, so the, given the upstream conditions, so you are given rho one, u one, and p one, right? So there are three equations, and these are the upstream parameters. Now, what are the unknowns? Unknowns are you want the downstream conditions as a function of upstream conditions. So you, those are rho two, u two, and p two. Right, and we are assuming you know we can we are assuming some sort of a ideal gas, uh, right? So so the internal energy density is equal to pressure by gamma minus one. So this is the the relation between thermal energy density and the pressure of this gas. <clears throat> so uh, the best way to actually solve these equations is to introduce something called R, this compression factor. Factor, which is nothing but rho two by rho one. But by this equation, this is also equal to U one by U two. Right. This is the mass conservation equation. Uh, so, um, if you solve these equations, there are three equations, three unknowns. You can actually analytically solve these equations. What you get is R, which is rho two by rho one equals u one by u two, is equal to gamma plus one times Mach squared by Gamma minus one times Mach squared plus two. But this Mach number is defined as U1 by CS1. So U1 is the velocity of the upstream gas which is approaching the shock. CS1 is the sound speed in the upstream condition. So CS1 is equal to gamma P1 by rho one. Right? And you can actually see when Mach number is large, the compression ratio becomes gamma plus one by gamma minus one, which is equal to four for 
gamma equals five thirds. So gamma equal to five thirds is the ideal gas, monoatomic ideal gas. Uh, similarly, P2 by P1. You see this one, basically, however strong the shock is, you can only compress that gas by a factor of four. You cannot raise the, uh, the density by more than a factor of four. But the pressure can actually be raised humongously. So you can have one plus twice gamma by gamma plus one Mach squared minus one. So this pressure in the large Mach number limit goes like Mach squared. So if your Mach number is huge, you know, Mach number can in principle be 100, 1000. You know, depends on this, the sound speed of the ambient medium. If it is very small, you can have very high Mach numbers. And then you can actually raise the post-shock pressure by a huge amount compared to the pre-shock pressure. And T2 in the mark, high mark number limit is 3 by 16 mu MP Vs squared. Vs is nothing but U1. Uh, if you are in the lab frame in which upstream material is at rest, Vs and U1 are equal to each other. Uh, and if we plug in the number, this is about 1.4 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin uh, mu by 0.6 proton mass times Vs by 1000 kilometer per second square. So if you have a shock which is moving at 1000 kilometer per second, uh, in a normal, like this 0.6 is the mean particle mass uh, for typical ISM abundance. So if you have a shock moving at 1000 kilometer per second, the post-shock temperature will be about 10 to the 7 Kelvin. Okay. <clears throat> so shocks can create a lot of hot gas. And that is how we are sort of, uh, we think that the hot phase of the interstellar medium is created. The supernova shocks, you know, cross uh, at you know thousands of kilometers per second, uh, run through the ISM and create hot phase. Um, so this is about Rankine Hugonio or adiabatic or non-radiative shocks. Uh, I'll just quickly mention uh, radiative or isothermal shocks. See, this you cannot really understand just by looking at it. I've sort of explained the concept, but you have to work it out in order to be confident in it. Huh? What are radiative shocks? So if you have a shock beyond which you have a, so this is row one, this is row two. If you have a strong shock, this is four times row one, right? Now, if this gas is able to cool radiatively, so previously we were ignoring any radiative losses. We were equate, you know, there were no radiative loss terms in the energy equation, right? Whatever kinetic energy came in, it got converted into thermal energy. Now, if this downstream plasma has a short cooling time, that happens when the density is high. In high density conditions, this uh, downstream plasma can radiatively cool. In that case, the density actually increases and temperature decreases. And there are like two discontinuities. This is the normal shock jump of factor of four. And here there is row three. Okay. And what happens is this T1, this is temperature T1, this is temperature T2, this is temperature T3. And in a lot of cases, this T3 is equal to T1. For example, if you have a shock which passes through a warm neutral medium or a warm ionized medium at 10 to the 4 Kelvin, it creates this intermediate temperature plasma at 10 to the 5 Kelvin. It radiatively loses its energy, but beyond that, it cools to 10 to the 4 again. That's a radiative shock. So radiative shocks are very common in dense regions of the ISF. Okay. In fact, they are more common than the rankine hugonio shocks. So what has happened is, in this case, the energy equation does not apply because you know you have lost energy to radiative cooling. 
Uh, and what you do is, again, you have the mass conservation. So you go to the shock rest frame. Again, all these calculations are done in shock rest frame so that you can apply tau by tau t equal to zero. So this whole, all these sort of three regions are sort of moving like this at the shock speed. So what happens? So uh, rho one u one is equal to rho three u three. So basically, you are integrating across the region two. Okay. So you have so there is steady state. Nothing changes in time at any place in this uh, this frame. So rho, so this is mass conservation. What momentum conservation also holds. But we don't have the energy equation. Instead of that, what we have is uh, P1 by rho 1 is equal to <coughs> P3 by rho 3. That's nothing but T1 equals T3. So these are the three equations. Again, we have three equations, three unknowns. If you set this up equation, these equations up in terms of this compression factor R, we will do row two by row one, row three by row one in this case. What you get is one plus m one minus one is equal to one by r plus m one inverse r. So where m one is the Mach number, isothermal Mach number. And this is just U1 by CS1. And this is isothermal sound This is square root of P1 by rho 1. So gamma uh, gamma is 1, basically. For isothermal sound speed, gamma is 1. And the isothermal is the relevant speed because T1, T3 is equal to T1. OK? So this is the quadratic equation that you get. If you solve it, it's trivial. So you either get R equal to one, which is the trivial solution, right? You know, that just gives you rho three equals rho one and u three equals u one, and everything is happily satisfied. The other solution, which is the non-trivial solution, is R equal to m one. Now notice, and in contrast to the adiabatic shock, here the compression ratio can be as high as you want. There it was only four. Here you can compress the gas much more because this gas in the post-shock uh, region has cooled and it has become more compressed because there's no pressure support and all that density gets squeezed and becomes higher. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the size of this radiative relaxation layer, this is called a radiative relaxation. All the radiation is confined here. This size is about uh, the shock velocity by four times T cool at this temperature. And shock velocity by four because the velocity uh, becomes U1 by four behind the adiabatic shock. So this is still an adiabatic jump. But it's so tiny that you don't, you, in these problems, you're not that interested in the structure here. But this is about your L cool. This is this this is the scale of this isothermal shock, the transition scale. For normal Rankine Hugonio shocks, the scale of transition is about a mean free path. You go from upstream to downstream conditions in about a mean free path. So if you have a atom or you know an ion coming from the upstream region and it sort of goes into the downstream region, when does it know that I have to heat up? Once it collides with the other downstream particles, that happens over a mean free path, okay? So this is, uh, yeah, so this is about radiative shocks. And, yes, hmm? yes, 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 VS. See, VS is used sometimes instead of V1, that's right. Uh, Okay, so I think we are done here. Uh, there's a lot, you know, there are these phases of the uh, supernova remnant. There's this free expansion phase and the Sether-Taylor phase and radiative phase and all that. 
And you know, if I had one more class, I would have covered that. But since we don't have it, it's useful to know it. So I know you guys are very anxious and eager to go now. Uh, but yeah, so I think we are done with the class. And yeah, good luck with your exams and the presentations.